partnered by Times Influence. Hello and welcome to the four-part special series on competitiveness of India, Porter Prize 2018. In the concluding episode, we bring to you Whitney Johnson, an expert on disruptive innovation and personal disruption to share her valuable insights on strategy, shared value and progress. First up to discuss best business strategies for companies, we have Deepak Jayaraman in conversation with Whitney Johnson. I'm going to uh, pick it up with a strategy question. Uh, when I look at businesses, business strategy is often about companies being coherent about where to play and how to win. So let's talk about picking the right S-curve. Give us a little bit of insight on how should people think about picking the right mountain to climb. It's a great question. Once you're at the top of the curve, you say, okay, I've made the decision, it's time to jump, but what do I do? And so this framework gives you an opportunity to kind of check through that. So number one, is this an opportunity for me to play where no one else is playing? Yeah, there might be some competitive risks, but is this playing as much as possible other people are not? Secondly, is it playing to your strengths? Because when you play to your strengths, and in particular, distinctive strengths, so for example, if you're a great marketer and you're trying to compete against 19 other marketers, that's a strength, but it's not distinctive. But if you can find a way to be a marketer in a room of 19 coders, now you not only feel strong, it's distinctive, and when you feel strong, you're comfortable playing where other people are not. Third one is you look at your constraints. We think, well, if I could move anywhere in the world or I could um, take any kind of job and it doesn't matter how much money I make. On the one hand, that sounds liberating, but on the other hand, actually, it's quite, it's quite paralyzing. Whenever you're trying to take on a new job or trying to transition, effectively what you're doing is saying, I want to jump to a new learning curve. But you're also saying to the person who you want to hire you, I want you to jump to a new learning curve. And it's not your learning curve, it's my learning curve. So how do I pack a parachute? How do I translate what I know how to do in a language where it basically de-risks it for them and they say, okay, this isn't scary. All right, I can hire this person. Even though on paper it doesn't quite look perfect, because I packed a parachute by translating what I know how to do into what you need me to do, then you're much more likely to hire me. And so those are a couple of examples of how you can use this framework to transition in your career. Let's start moving on the curve now. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the true transition points in that S-curve. Mm -hmm. uh, one is when the curve begins to take off. Uh, you call it from inexperience to engagement when you really start uh, playing to your strengths. And the other is when the curve starts tapering off, which is when uh, boredom or mastery yeah. kicks in. So talk to us about how could we, what are the lead indicators to look for for us to know that we are in that phase of that curve? You're getting the momentum. Okay, so there are a couple of markers that you can look at. So when you're moving from inexperience, well, so inexperience, as I mentioned to you, you feel, um, it's like this jumble of puzzle pieces, right? You don't know how any of those pieces put together and you come to work every day and you're like, and this doesn't just, by the way, apply to people at the beginning of the career. This is for all you CEOs too, new CEOs, you're like, I don't quite know how to do this job, and you're not going to admit it to anybody, but let's face it, you all feel that way. You're putting this together, and so you have lots of days where you feel discouraged. Well, the way you know that you're going to start to move into that sweet spot is if you're mapping against the 10,000-hour rule, it's going to be about six months. You also might know because last week you felt like you knew what you were doing for 20 hours or eight hours, and this week it's 16 hours, so that exponential growth is starting to kick in. And you're finding that you're having more and more days where you're feeling competent, and more and more days where you're feeling confident, and more and more days where work is fun, and more and more days where it's hard but not too hard, but still it's easier but not too easy, if that makes sense. It's sure. the Goldilocks principle for those of you just who right. like Goldilocks. It's just right. And what does the tapering of the curve look like? I guess you spoke about what the liftoff looks like. Yeah. What does the tapering of the curve look like? Yeah, so... So again, if you're mapping against the 10,000 hour rule um, and you're not making any changes, right? This doesn't mean that you can't stay in a role for longer than four years, but four years is a good rule of thumb that once you get to that top, you need to start evaluating. 
what happens at the top of the curve is that your brain starts chunking. It's like brushing your teeth. You just know how to do it. You get in a car, you put it on automatic. And so if you find yourself kind of dialing it in, saying things like, I've paid my dues, that means you're starting to get bored. And that means you need to do something else. Now, there are a couple of different solutions. One can be that you give yourself, for example, if you're a CEO and you're like, I'm getting kind of bored. Maybe you need to go into a new market. Maybe you need to bring on some new people to mentor. So there are different ways to do it. But at that top, you're feeling like you want to dial it in. You're not as excited. I had one a coach who's using this framework say, the CEO said to her, oh, now I know why I'm cranky. <laughs> I'm cranky because I'm bored. And so that's what it looks like at the top. Uh, what advice do you have for people to uh, cut their losses? Because sometimes ah. you can get into a new situation, you're quite excited about the S-curve, and then six months pass and you realize there's new information and the thing, what you thought it would be and what it is are often quite different. Yeah. So how should people think about persisting versus cutting losses? Okay, so here's a quick checklist for you. Number one, are you taking the right kinds of risks? Are you playing where no one else is playing? So that may feel wrong, but you know it's just supposed to feel that way. Number two, are you playing to your strengths, your distinctive strengths? Number three, is it hard but not debilitating? Meaning, do you show up at work every day and go, this is really hard, but I feel so alive. That's good, growth is on its way. If instead you find yourself dreading work, you hate Monday morning, you're getting sick. That's happened to me. You get sick when you're on the wrong curve. Symptoms of a flatlining curve. And then number four is, are you getting momentum? Is it four hours? Is it eight hours? Is it 16 hours? Then you know that it's the right, uh, the right curve. So if your answers to all those are no, then it's the wrong curve and it's time to cut your losses. Here's the good news. No S curve is ever wasted. If you really believe that we're always about learning, no S curve is ever wasted. And if you can say yes, well then just hang in there because the growth, it's going to come. Let me move to hiring. One of the themes you talk about is um, hiring for potential, mm -hmm. especially if you're a leader trying to manage a portfolio of S-curves in your team. Don't hire for uh, capability or expertise, but hire for people who are at the bottom of the S-curve. So talk to us about uh, what leaders should look for when they are hiring for potential. They've got to have some basic skills, right? The hiring is a little bit of a vanity exercise of we want a person with an MBA from this school and then we will feel important because we hired this person from that school. And I th hiring for potential is what are the minimum requirements that I need from this person from a skill set perspective? What are the minimum requirements? And then beyond that, is this a person who knows how to learn? Is this a person who will, is hungry? Is this a person who can play on a team, play nicely on a team? So you hire for those basic skills and then look for the skills of a person who knows how to learn. And then what happens is if you hire at the low end of the curve, because they've got three or four years to learn, you've got four years with this person as opposed to a person at the top of the curve who in six months is gonna be bored. And now what do you do with them? You're not gonna fire them but then they're not productive. And so if you're high up for potential, look at the basic requirements, find a person who's willing to learn, then you're going to be able to hire much better, hire people who innovate, hire people who are asking questions, and it allows your organization to be much more innovative as opposed to complacent, bored at the top of the curve. How the hiring is different when you hire for potential versus when you hire for uh, experience, how does the process or the kind of questioning or inquiry you run differ when you hire for potential versus when you hire for experience? So on the job descriptions, I think we kind of just talked about that, of just looking at the basic requirements as opposed to, you know, there are some jobs, for example, we say we need an MBA, but the fact is they may not even need a college degree, <laughs> really. And, and there are lots of ways now to credential people without having to have them have a college degree. So I think that's the first thing. Um, the second way, and you can find out a lot in the interview process, you know, is this a person who comes in and asks you questions? So part of, I think, hiring for potential, not for proficiency, is a person who's coming in and clearly very interested, engaged, asking questions, 
trying to figure out what that might look like and what you really need so you're almost co-creating that job together. And then the other thing I would say, and you didn't ask this, but I think it's important, is sometimes when we hire, we use the same job description that we used four years ago when over time things have really evolved and there are people on your team who are actually already playing that role. And so if you hire someone to do that same role, you've created competitive risk on your team and disincentivize them. So really rethink what your description is. Very interesting. And, and the other thing I wanted to sort of maybe briefly mention is you also say that when you hire for potential, there's a greater chance of having more women in the leadership team and there's a greater uh, opportunity for diversity, at least from a gender yes. perspective. So maybe if you yeah. could expand on that a little okay. bit. Okay. There's research that's been done that says that men are judged on their potential and women are judged on their track record, number one. So we're more likely to hire a man who doesn't have the skills because we think he's got the potential. And we'll look at a woman and say, she's never done that before, can't hire her. So that's one piece. The second piece is, is that what they found is that if a man doesn't know how to do the job, he'll be like, I can learn it, I'll figure it out. And a woman won't actually apply for a job unless she can do 100% of the job requirements. So what that means is frequently when you hire a woman, she's probably further up the S curve than you think she is. And it means that when you hire a man, he might be further down the S-curve than you think he is. And so you can obviously um, calibrate for that, but it's really interesting to know that. And so when you're willing to be a little bit more minimalist in your job requirements, you're probably going to get more women who are willing to apply. Got it. Let's talk about organizations. We've spoken about individuals, and I think you yeah. alluded to what it takes to uh, uh, make this possible. What's the implication for leadership? Again, uh, for the CEOs in the room, uh, what's the mindset shift required for them to start running organizations with this sort of a paradigm? Well, first of all, I would say um, to realize that you yourself are on a learning curve. I think that's really, really important is to recognize that, okay, maybe I've been in this role for five years and maybe I'm getting a little bit bored. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to quit or step down as CEO. What can CEOs do? they can make it possible for people to practice personal disruption. If you have people on your team who are high performers and high potentials, if they want to try something new, let them. You know, Alan Mulally, former CEO of Ford, you know what he says? When you're the CEO, your face isn't yours anymore. Everything you do, everything you do is micro, it's micro, not micromanaged, but it's analyzed in, in detail. If you do just one or two of these high profiles, let people disrupt, you'll start to see some movement. And when you start to see that movement, you're going to see more innovation. And then you will be able to disrupt rather than be disrupted. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back. Next up in a special segment, Thinkers, to understand frameworks of disruptive innovation, we have Sunanda Jayasilan of ET Now in conversation with Whitney Johnson. Let me start by first and foremost, and I found this very interesting. Uh, you said companies are not the ones who are disrupting, companies are not the ones that are eventually going to do the disruption, but it's the people of the companies who are going to disrupt, the people who are going to be involved in that disruption. My question to you is how perhaps companies should ensure that they are keeping pace with these changes that are happening? How can more companies say that my employees need to think like innovators? I need to change to ensure that I'm giving them also the platform to do that. Well, a great place to start is oftentimes when people uh, have gotten to the point where they want to try something new, they're, the tendency to say, I want that job or I want that job or I want that job. One of the ways you can really get people to thinking like an innovator is to say to them, well, those jobs aren't necessarily available. They're taken by someone else. But I want you to really think about what are some problems that you think our company needs to solve or some problems that are not being solved. And 
are, are those problems that you can solve? And if you can go out and create a business case for me about why we need to go after that, and it will generate five times the income of what I'm actually paying you, then that's a way for them to create an opportunity for themselves because now there's a job, they've created the job, they've created the opportunity, but in the process of finding something for themselves to do, they've actually just now innovated for the company. So one of the best ways for people to innovate is just to figure out a problem that they think they want to solve, make the case for why the company needs to solve it, and then if you're, if you're the right kind of manager, you'll say, okay, you made the case, let's try it and see what happens. And that, I think, is the best way for a company to remain innovative. How are companies ensuring that they're hiring right? What should a company keep in mind when it comes to hiring right? Because that is half the battle won. It is a big question. I think one of the things that we do sometimes is we're, we're looking to hire people and we hire people who are already expert at what they know how to do. And because we're hiring an expert, it, it, not necessarily, when I say expert, they can have domain expertise, but they're at the top of a learning curve. They figured out how to do something. And so now they're going, you're going to hire them. They're going to come in and you might get them to be there for six months or a year and then they're going to be bored. They figured out how to navigate things internally, but now they're done. And so one of the ways that you can hire to um, retain people, hire people who are excited about being there, hire people who are going to be willing to innovate is hire people who are at the bottom of their learning curve. They've got some expertise, but not all the expertise that they need. And in the process of them figuring out how to do their job, they're going to also innovate on behalf of your company. And, um, and by the way, you're going to be a boss that they want to work for because you gave them a shot when other people didn't. And there's going to be tremendous loyalty that comes as well. And with that loyalty, engagement, happiness, they become a brand ambassador for your organization. One thing that we don't talk about enough, unfortunately, is culture and how you ensure that, at least for small businesses, that the culture that you have of the leader is something that's also percolating down, that you're ensuring that the culture is something that everyone is adhering to. How do you do that? I think it certainly starts with the leader. First of all, you, you have to kind of keep some of your emotions to yourself. You have to share those emotions, but not with the people who work for you. And you can also never say something bad about anybody you work with. And if you are frustrated, then you've got to find a place to do it, either with your family, but not too much, or with a coach, um, but someone that you, where is a safe place to do it. You can have those feelings, but they don't get amplified in a way that's destructive to the culture. In India, if you look at the data of women who are involved in the workforce, it's lower than some sub-Saharan countries. There aren't enough women who move up the ladder here in India when it comes to corporate India. What's it like in the U.S.? And perhaps using that experience to talk to our viewers about how more women can be encouraged to not just join the workforce, but stay in the workforce. Yeah. What I would say is when women aren't able to move up, um, there are going to be some things that they need to do to improve and, and to hone their skills. But there's also research that has shown that women have to be two and a half times more competent than men in order to be on equal footing. And so to recognize that there's some ecosystem s situations or issues that you've got to deal with. I think one of the things that we can do if we really want to bring women along is it's going to involve men. So part of what's going to have to happen, I believe, for women in India, in the United States, everywhere, we need men who are saying, I want to bring women along, I'm not sure how to do it, is to say, come, sit at that table, talk, you've got something to offer. And by the way, I've got your back because I'm your sponsor. You were talking about the ecosystem previously. I just want to go back to that and talk about the role of the government when it comes to encouraging entrepreneurship. Uh, here in India, the government, particularly where tech is involved, has come up with a regulatory framework, but the direct involvement as far as day-to-day -day running of businesses, etc., uh, that's something that entrepreneurs argue for on both sides, saying that, yes, you need more government involvement, and no, you don't. It should best be left at a hands-off approach. Your view on perhaps what is the best a framework to have as far as the government is concerned when it comes to encouraging entrepreneurs? What I would say is that in any situation, I think individuals need to believe that it's all up to them to make it happen. I, I, I believe that we have to believe that we are made to act and not be acted upon and not rely on the government. So if you can't get help from the government, you want them just to stay out of the way and let you do your job. Um, in the meantime, I think there are things that the government can do in terms of providing funding to 
women-owned businesses, for example. Um, but in my experience in the United States, where things are really effective is where you have accelerators, where you have um, incubators for business, where you have resources where people can get um, advice, they can get capital, they can get access to, to experts that they need. And so to the extent that the government can fund those types of institutions or organizations, I think that's probably the most helpful because then they're funding an ecosystem that they then can is expert in helping you get done what you want to do in terms of your business taking off. Okay, let's talk innovation. First and foremost, even some of the biggest companies here in India tell us that the shareholders don't understand that they're investing into R&D and therefore innovation and that at the end of the day, it's a question of ROI. Have you ever had that question thrown at you? How do you sort of uh, then tell entrepreneurs that yes, it's necessary to invest into innovation and R&D perhaps because that's what go is going to hold you in the long run? Well, I mean, at the end, it, it, yes, you've got to have ROI. It, it depends on your perspective, right? And so that's part of the reason why I think it's important if possible as a small and medium-sized business owner is to be willing to bootstrap your business, to self-fund it. Because when you're willing to self-fund, a couple of things happen. Number one is you are very impatient for profits. Because if you don't have profits, you're going to go out of the business. And also, the other thing is then you prioritize. You make decisions. You make choices. You can have too much money. You can have too many resources and you're, you're really in trouble. And so when you also when you self-fund, what happens is that you're not accountable to investors. When you're willing to bootstrap or have very, very patient investors, you've got a time frame that allows you to do the investing that you need to do without having to focus on ROI tomorrow. And so it's a matter of are you focused short-term, long-term. When you bootstrap, you can be long-term. If you've got the right investors, you can be long-term. But I would really recommend that people bootstrap as long as possible so that you're making the right strategic decisions for your investment. My question to you is whether, in your opinion, entrepreneurs in countries like India should perhaps look at innovating for India, not necessarily innovating perhaps for the globe. Or do you think that both can happen? Um, sometimes we want to innovate the way our next door neighbor is innovating. But the reality is, is that our na my ne next door neighbor has different problems that he's trying to solve than I'm trying to solve. And so there, um, if, if India, or any country for that matter, would focus on what are the problems that we need to solve here today and focus on solving those problems, I think that you will discover and we will all discover that some pretty grand innovations will come from that. Part of the problem I think is happening is that India, in this instance, is comparing itself to the United States. And we don't ever do very well when we try to compare ourselves because this is a magnificent country. So focus on what do you have? What are, what are your distinctive strengths and what do you bring to the world stage because of who you are as India as opposed to trying to be another country? Uh, we also love uh, talking about the role that celebrating failures perhaps have in an entrepreneur's life cycle. What role do you think it has? Well, failure is really tough. And I, I know we talk about celebrating failure, but I don't think we really mean it. We mean celebrate my failure, but I'm certainly not going to celebrate your failure. And part of the reason it's so difficult for us is that we tie our identity to our successes or failures. Failure is an event. It's not a person. And then, again, do that inner work of getting our sense of identity to the point where when a failure happens, actually, if you think about it, it's actually learning. Because when I get information in my head, that's just information. I actually haven't learned anything until I've taken that information, tested it, and seen what happens. We call that failure, but in fact, it's learning. So focus on your identity and then reframe what you're defining and calling failure. Perhaps one or two things that you think successful businesses are doing and unsuccessful businesses, so businesses that are failing are perhaps doing, and use that to sort of talk to a viewers to say, this is perhaps what you should avoid. I think you can be a successful business taking on competitive risk of saying, okay, there's that business over here and I want to compete against them. Um, but you've got to really figure out, can I be successful in competing against them? You might be able to, you might not to. And it looks really attractive because you can scope it out. They're right there. You're gunning for them. But successful businesses who are continually successful are the ones who don't look at competitive risk. They look at market risk. They look at where no one else is playing. They look at... Um, what would it look like to go over there? And it doesn't look very fun because no one's there. No one's on the playground. I don't want to go there. I don't want to play there. And yet the data, the research shows from a disruption perspective that your odds of success are actually six times higher when you're willing to play where no one else is playing. 
it feels less risky or feels more risky because no one's there, but in fact, it's less risky. And so businesses that are willing to compete where they can, but also look for as many opportunities as possible to compete where other people aren't competing are more likely to be successful. Okay, Whitney, thank you very much for speaking with us. Porter Prize presented by Institute for Competitiveness and the Times Network finally concluded on a very promising note, motivating companies to compete on the basis of value creation, innovation and strategy, which resulted in sustainable profitability and enhances the competitiveness of India. Partnered by Times Influence.